in doing a lot of my preparation and research and pre-production for not only this interview but for also my eighth anniversary episode tomorrow episode 140 of mediamonarchy.com i've essentially been using the historycommons.org complete 911 timeline in conjunction with something put up by a guy named Jonathan Elenoff who's behind a documentary series called core of corruption.com he has posted up and i believe at current count 153 videos as a playlist on youtube of nothing but mainstream media tv abc nbc cbs fox going all the way back to at least the 70s and covering many of the things that we've just now mentioned whether it's drug running or money scandals or anthrax or 9-11 i put together and looked at some of the bigger pieces and some of the related things and the insider trading is one that you can look at and see well it was covered they talked about it and it instantly went away so it's there but in the days and weeks and even months post 9-11 the insider trading is one of those stories that slowly went by the wayside I think as we look around right now, we should see that with our bailouts and crumbling economy, that again, you know, as we just said, you and other people have been talking about the, the funny money dealings for a long time. So again, past is prologue. Well, I, I, I'd like to say that uh, Elinoff is a sharp researcher and he's an excellent filmmaker and his movie is not a minute too long. I think that everything he's trying to do as far as offer out all those clips, I've seen all those clips, I've got them on our site, on a community as well posted. And it's like, look, we all need to realize that the media did a lot of useful work for us. They have a lot of media clips out there that haven't been uh, corrupted yet. And these can be preserved and studied and used to put together the story. They didn't tell us the truth about what happened that day. But the truth is scattered throughout those pieces because you can see what, play, what pieces they wanted to take away right away and say, look, we published that, but we're not going to talk about it again. It's just like Dan Rather talking about the 1993 World Trade Center bombing and Ahmad Salem, right? That's there. You can show people that clip, but they talk today like it never happened. So, you know, corporate media has a, a you know a sharper edge because they give you 50% of the information, but what you really need is the 50% they can't give you because it hurts their advertisers, right? And you nailed it right there. It hurts their advertisers. This, yeah, this message brought to you by our advertisers. Mm. By the way, it's no, those kind of TV news videos that have Peter Jennings and Dan Rather and people from Fox and all those regular guys that people would at least recognize and trust to some degree. And it's those kind of things, again, that I feel are really effective in trying to communicate a lot of this information to folks. So it's not some scary documentary with spooky music to tell you when something bad is being talked about. It's just here, here it is. Here's that thing that ran, you know, on your television back in the 70s or 80s or 90s or 2000s. It's that kind of stuff that, again, for folks who are either combative or unwilling or who honestly, perhaps don't care about any kind of research such as what we're talking about. Well, and that, that ties back into belief because, you know, we are victimized by our beliefs. I think, uh, you know, we are infected by inaccurate perspectives. And I think that, you know, when you look at belief, belief only exists absent certain facts that otherwise, if those facts were present, the belief would be eradicated, right? So the beliefs are all kind of like our blind spots, the things that we didn't actually look at or experience for ourselves but we have this idea about what happened that's a belief and you know what I bet when you examine that situation closely it's not nearly as you know you were presented it because I think a lot of people not listening to this podcast of course but I'm trying to help your audience be able to communicate with their family and friends and other people who don't do enough autodidactic activity in their life not enough self-learning and I think it's important for us to be able to be you know build a bridge so we have to be able to articulate that, you know, people have become infected with media memes and advertisements and things that allow us to, in our minds, dehumanize people on the other side of the world. And it's like, um, you know, personally, when you're willing to hate no one, then you'll have peace for yourself. And it's not until you have peace for yourself or, you know, in my opinion, are you a responsible person to go out and spread this type of information? Because if you have to come from an aspect of fear, 
either you haven't done enough homework or you're not a good enough salesperson to sell without fear. And I think that's what took me a, a longer time to feel confident in trying to have a, a news blog or a radio show. It took a few years of me studying this stuff more or less secretively, because in 2002 and 2003 it wasn't exactly common discussion to talk about 9-11 questions. So I spent several years reading a lot, listening a lot, watching all the documentaries, going through all the bits and pieces that at some point I realized, okay, I don't believe every single word of this, but ultimately I've seen enough to know that in most of these instances that we're talking about, I don't know exactly what happened. I'm not postulating theories. All I know is that the official story can't be true. So hopefully... That's a, that's a great starting place. Because I don't know either, but that that's what keeps people like myself, yourself, your audience, like alive and surviving. Because we are aware, we are conscious, we are paying attention, we're learning, we're growing, we're communicating, we're taking ourselves and putting ourselves in uncomfortable situations, less than comfortable surroundings to do what we do. Because there's easier ways to go do, and if you wanted to go make money, there's a hundred easier ways to go do anything. This is the hardest way to kind of scratch out a living because you got to work three jobs basically, you know, in order to keep yourself running over there, right, James? Just about, just about. Yeah, and I even, you know, you know there are times, and in, in just even this last week, and I find myself kind of stewing about it as we're approaching the anniversary, and, and, and I have a lot of research and a lot of things on my plate for Media Monarchy all kind of culminating in this weekend. But a couple of nights ago, this is just a, a sidebar, and we'll get back on track in just a moment, I went out after work. There was a going-away party for a girl who's leaving the store that I work at. So we went to essentially a dive karaoke bar, and I had a blast, drinking and dancing and singing and having a good old time, and was able for a few moments to kind of forget and not think about what is really going down and what we're really being faced with, in a way almost feeling sometimes guilty that, you know, what are you doing out dancing and singing karaoke? There's a lot of important work to do. It's hard not to get bogged down with all of this. And again, it's hard to juggle the sort of, I, I made the joke to you, I believe, earlier this day. It was like, gee, it's hard to live three lives, which is, of course, a tongue-in-cheek reference to Lee Harvey Oswald. It's, it's hard to be a news radio guy as well as a good employee, as well as a 